So let's talk about, now that I've indulged myself a little bit, um, get off my, my soapbox, um, and talk about image and politics. And I've talked about framing and agenda setting. Um, and in thinking about the films and the exhibition, it's amazing, in fact, we were talking about this before, how emotional they were. I think some of you have seen the films in the exhibition, if, uh, maybe, yes, no? Did anyone else find them emotionally moving? Yeah, yeah. Which is funny because I'm not, you know, a Polish anti-abortion crusader or I don't live in the West Bank. But I think that um, there is emotion there. And so now we're going to talk about um, another emotional image, uh, which I want to do. Now, before I put this up, I'd like you to get an image in your head, please. We're going to talk about 9-11. Um, and I want you just to think of what image or images spring to mind. And, we'll talk, and I want to talk about image and culture and how culturally specific image can be, as, as I struggle to deal with Apple. <laughs> Do you see the other side? Yeah. Ha <laughs> ah, ha, it's funny. Right. I assume this is labeled me. So there we go. Okay. So here we go. Right. It's not It's not the greatest, and I had a little tiny classroom, so it's not, it's not fantastic resolution. Right, so just kind of squint, or actually in my vision, that looks fine, but never mind. Right, so this, this is who would be the dominant image in the United States. This is the image of 9-11, okay? It's a, you know, it's a building. It's a building on fire. We can make some inferences about things that are happening to the people inside the building, but we're not, we're not being shown them. Um, and even this image is very rarely used in the United States. Images of 9-11 are, are um, basically, uh, it's considered unpatriotic. Uh, so they wouldn't generally figure very often in any kind of common thing. For example, although I reviewed a great deal of uh, political advertising in 2004, and I wrote about the framing of terrorist threat in elections, and Bush was very successful in making, reminding people that they, you know, there was this, this, this terrorist threat, this war on terror, even though it made absolutely no sense logically, he was very, very good at it. Um, but, you know, these sorts of images weren't used. Okay, now here's another image. This is the image, a very famous image that was shot in the day of a man um, committing suicide. Well, or, or jumping out of a burning building and he was going to die either way. Um, many, many people jumped. Um, and you could, you could hear them falling, actually, on the day. Newscasters turned away. They stopped filming. Not only did they not film it and not show it, they didn't film it. And they didn't talk about it. First time I saw this image, and I'm someone who studied studying the coverage of 9-11 in America was about a month ago when I was prepping for a class. And this is from a documentary, which you could watch in full on YouTube, called The Falling Man. So if you just go on YouTube and type in Falling Man. It's a, it's a fascinating documentary. And it's about what was seen and not seen. So, same image. Not an acceptable image to Americans. It ran in the, like, page seven or eight of the New York Times the day after. It's just taken by a, a well-known photographer. He happened to be in the area uh, because he was doing the Trinity Wear shoot, interestingly. This is sort of the garment district of New York. Um, and, it, and he talks about, you know, sort of a little self-defensively, like, why would you take the pictures? Like, it's what I do. You know, the carpenter has a hammer. I have a camera. You just do what you do. Um, this is a true image. It did happen. It is just as much a legitimate image. But it's not, it's not an image that Americans are willing to see. Um, why? Because it's a person as opposed to an event. Because it makes it too visceral. Because, as another American said to me, it makes the terrorists win. Because you're forced to confront the individual um, sadness of the event. And that, that's just not something you should give into as a loyal American. <clears throat> so, I wanted to sort of, to bring up this, this notion of image because different images resonate in different cultures in very different ways. And when, when I study the media and when we think about image, um, we, we often find that, that what is a, a particularly important resonant image in one culture is not in another. For example, um, just because this is a, a British one, now, this, this is probably a fairly resonant image for Brits. It's, a, it's the classic image of Bloody Sunday, of trying to bring a you know, Catholic priest coming forward, trying to bring out someone who's been wounded by the British soldiers. Uh, an image which resonates throughout the Northern Ireland conflict, and here you see it again, although change slightly, augmented, as it were. So you can't, you can't look at that image. It's not, 
and say that image is, is, is not a political image? And why that image and not another? Similarly, when we think about images of terrorism, you hear, again, like the Twin Towers, this is a, a shot of destruction, of building destruction, but not of, of broken bodies. Um, and in some ways, the images of terrorism are more personal and visceral um, in, in, in Russia. This is the Moscow Theater siege, and that's Beslan. Uh, so that's a, a special forces soldier bringing out a dehydrated child. Uh, which is the iconic image. And what's interesting is there's, there's far more harrowing pictures of the Beslan siege, and a newspaper editor published them. He did a special photographic supplement inspired by Putin. And the Russian public said, and yes, and the right thing too, because he was just uh, using people's tragedy in a completely inappropriate way. And to sort of uh, to think about that and to kind of um, to conclude that part of it is my work has found that Americans and Russians have very similar sensibilities about things. Sometimes they just simply don't want to see things. And they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I, there's something you don't need to see, you need to know. I find that quite fascinating because they're technically extremely different societies. But in some ways, maybe there's a superpower mentality where there's a, a way of living in a strong state that you just have to not know. The way in which there was a huge controversy about whether And it's that curious synergy um, across culture and image that I find really, really interesting. Um, the final note I'll make in the three minutes I have left is to think about the internet's role in this, because I did promise to say, will the revolution be podcast? I think not. I think not because I think the revolution might be able to be podcast within a particular country. But an international revolution, a workers' revolution, um, any kind of um, uh, sort of, I'm thinking of WTO protests or anti-globalization movements, I find it unlikely that those are going to reach out to people in the same way as across the internet. A lot of the power of the image is the shared experience of the image, the moment of the image, whether that's um, this, you know, at the end of the day, this is not, you know, it's a blown up bus, but it's a powerfully evocative image for the British people because it's a moment in time when Britain was attacked by terrorists. And in many ways, one could argue that Britain withstood that attack um, and came out of it um, as a nation that, that, that wasn't going to be, that refused, unlike the Americans and the Russians, to fundamentally change their political direction because of a terrorist attack. And that's what my book, um, Terrorism, Legends, and Democracy, talks about. The Brits are fundamentally different. The Brits sort of refuse to pander to the politics of fear. And, and, and that's quite fascinating. You could say, well, they haven't experienced as much. Well, yeah, they have in terms of Northern Ireland. So, so what's different about the way British people can withstand images of terrorism in a way that, that Russians or Americans apparently can't? Um, so that's, that's quite interesting. We know that um, one of the most fertile lines of inquiry um, in terms of thinking about the internet is now YouTube, going onto YouTube, looking at the images that are web that cast there, thinking about what becomes popular, thinking about what is not popular, but also thinking, watching what people write underneath them. And so you have this wonderful lab for uh, understanding or trying to understand how people process images and what, what they bring to the image and what they take away from the image. And I think at that, I'll, I'll stop and we can sort of broaden this out into uh, questions slash comments you may have about your own feelings of image and culture. <laughs> 